Welcome to the dark forest. Jackie and her pals will never bore us. Shameless confessions about our obsession will make us laugh and smile. So let's explore the dark forest and dork down for a while. Hi, this is Jackie Cation. Welcome to the dork forest. Guess what? It's June and we have a sponsor and the sponsor is TiVo. And if you don't know about TiVo, well, that's odd to me because Pat Oswalt did a joke about it a million years ago because TiVo was the first DVR as far as I could tell. And it was about how it was the greatest gift he had ever received, greater even than the gift of life. I'm going to put a link to that joke in the notes. Anyway, but before TiVo, you had to watch TV when it was on. You had to VHS record it, possibly. You might remember those days. But if you missed it or part of it, you had to wait for reruns until you saw it again. So TiVo, he, it changed all that. And there are other DVRs, but TiVo is clearly the best. TiVo makes TV a thousand times better. That's their slogan. I believe it. I'm excited about TiVo, quite honestly. But TiVo has TiVo Stream, where you can watch it on your iPad or all over the house, right? You can transfer your favorite recordings and take them with you, like on airplanes and buses and not in your car. Please don't watch television in your car. TiVo is also the only one that searches both cable and the web to find any movie, any show, any video at the press of a button, right? Including YouTube, like Netflix, Hulu Plus, Amazon, YouTube. Now they're just like more channels on your TV. And TiVo Mini makes your TiVo box work on a second TV in your house. So that is the TiVo ad. And I'm excited that TiVo sponsor the Dork Forest this month. And I'm going to get a TiVo dork and we're going to do an episode. Hello, Greg Proops. Welcome to the Dork Forest. Thank you, Jackie. It's awfully verdant in here. Is it verdant? Yes. What does that mean? Green. There we go. Like that. Uh, it's, it is it's, green. It's a whole... Dork, 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 dork. Yeah, we got the, we got the Dork Forest. Uh, we got, you, you picked your shirt. You, uh, you get a free shirt when you do the Dork Forest and you went with the, uh, the green Brett Chambers fan designed, uh, Dork Forest, which has Elvish on the bottom. Oh, that's what that language was. I was yes. wondering what like, yeah, ye uta vien is. Yes. yes. I, I don't point. speak Kenya myself, so I don't have the pronunciation. My Latin's better. Uh, uh, but the, uh, is Elvish from like the Lord of the Rings Elvish? Yes. It's what Aragorn says when he finds the white tree at the end of uh, The Return oh. of the King. Yes. Wow. And I, I love that the elves, uh, for however, um, you know, uh, mystical and ancient their culture was, yes. use regular exclamation points as we do. <laughs> They did. They did. They to said to overemphasize themselves. elvish yes. excitement. When they were on Twitter, they used they used it a little too much. It was the hashtag. <laughs> too many characters in Elvish. It was hashtag Elrond was here. Gone. I just watched The Hobbit on a plane uh, oh. a couple of weeks ago. I hadn't seen it. Right, right. And it ends before it ends. That's what blew my mind. Like they took forever to make this picture. Right. And then it ends before they get to the treasure with the dragon. Sure, that's because they they what they did is they took a bunch of un they they took. Some some unpublished stuff. They took a bunch of stuff from the appendices from uh -huh. Lord of the Rings, so, so you can get backstory on the dwarves and all right. this stuff. Instead of it's just not the journey back and again, it's the whole thing. They're gonna go, which I thought that he, I liked it better than Lord of the Rings actually. I did too. The I was yeah. more I, I was more interested. Yeah. The second and third ones get real long, and there's way too many CGI orcs for my taste. Like <laughs> yeah. when they pull back and it's just thousands of people milling around. Yeah. I'm like, well, nah, characters, characters, characters. That's what we like. It's let's meet an actual orc what's his yeah, life like? right what, does he have a family does he have dinner what's happening the few times you get to uh see them talk then you get like in the book i remember reading the trilogy in high school right. you know i would come home and be high and and i would read it, it was really popular when i was in high school back in the 30s right and, um, <laughs> excellent <laughs> the, well, you know, that's all you had during the depression yeah <laughs> oh no that's uh, just that and uh <laughs> i'm playing monopoly on a, a checkerboard tablecloth because we didn't have you know cardboard right use pennies yeah, oh, or yeah. just one yeah, just pennies yeah right right instead of the <laughs> They didn't have the Scotty dog in the cannon. Uh, why was there a cannon? Um, right. But I, I, yeah, I thought the Hobbit, you know, I, I didn't love the guy who played uh, Bilbo. He was okay. But I, I, when it stopped right. before they got to the dragon, I was like, yeah. the whole part of the book when you're little is that mm -hmm. he, he, there's the whole scene with the dragon and the dragon talks to him and has never met a Hobbit before. Right. And yeah, he doesn't know thought, what he smells oh, like. There's all this gold, you know, literal gold uh, mm -hmm. that he's hiding. But all this sort of plot gold that they, I thought, mm, give me 20 more minutes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then it had already gone on at that point. I was on a coast to coast plane flight and it barely finished the bloody movie, right? Like it's oh, so. Oh, right. Cause it's three hours. Yeah. It's, it's, mm -hmm. oh my God. Like, talk about liftoff. It takes a year to get out of the 
the Shire, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. They did. I mean, they, they do the uh, whole dinner party with the song and with everything. The song yeah, and yeah. everything, and yeah. they a lot of backs. And they, we get to see uh, dwarves with beards. Like, dwarf, dwarf ladies. Did you get to see the dwarf ladies yeah. with beards? Oh my god! The, I've learned more about dwarvish culture than I ever knew, uh, or you thought you'd ever wanted. That know. I thought I never wanted. Well, and of course, Tolkien. Of course. Um, Oh, I'm spacing the word right now. That when he he studied language, philologist. I think was he? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, he was a philologist. Oh yeah, well, he created and, Elvish and all that. Right? And created Elvish and created all these things and these this uh, and it came from um, all these you know ancient texts. Sure. And obviously, clearly, but uh, I I have always loved Lord of the Rings. But we were going to talk about Rome. Oh, okay. Let's talk about Rome. I like I, one, one last bit on yeah, Tolkien. Yeah, sure. He, he he was a World War One veteran, and he right. had a very horrible time in World War One, as so many did. Did he have a hard war? Yeah, uh, <laughs> the, that, that great war, as we yes. call it. And um, he, the, you know, the black cloud coming around the earth and all that. Yeah. Uh, in the, in you know, the, that's taking hold of Middle Earth and all that. Everybody always thought it was an analogy for World War Two because mm. he finished it in what the sixty. When did it come out in the well fifty two? Yeah. I think. Uh, well, I, yeah, but I it know. wasn't in his. Uh, I've read things about him where he said, "No, it, it's utterly about World War One." He detested the telephone and he detested cars. Oh, right. Like he's re- a real hobbit. Like yeah. he, you know. Uh, uh, He's a simple man of the yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. He just Books wanted his garden. And yeah, yeah. Want yeah. to read? Don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. And but you know, and he also, but I, you know, he so clearly said several times that he didn't like metaphors, and he was like, mm. it wasn't a metaphor for anything. And you're like, everything's a metaphor for something. Of course. Of course. What you lived through permeates your fiction, yes, right? Yes. How could it not, you big weirdo? I mean, I get it. You don't want everyone going, is Gandalf Jesus? And he yeah, comes right, back right, because he comes and, back, right, because he and, returns uh, and he's... You know, spoiler yeah, yeah. alert, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you haven't read that book from the 50s. No, he didn't like metaphor. It's interesting. I think he thought he was writing a straight-up fairy story in, mm-hmm. in The Hobbit and then on The Lord of the Rings. But like you say, you can't... Your life experience uh, informs everything you write. Everything you write. So yeah. how are you supposed to... <laughs> it's like some of my worst stand-up, I look back at yeah. it and I'm like... Oh, that's because I wasn't, that didn't have anything to do with me. Right. That didn't, you know, that all I was is, was making fun of that punk rock song or whatever. Well, that right? letter that you keep in your house about how to be a stand up, I was perusing it uh, oh, yeah? briefly again. And, uh, it's just so well written and so perfect. And uh, that one sentence, Kanda, is it? Oh, uh, Vanda. Vanda yeah. says, um, Kanda. I went Lord of the Rings. Right. <laughs> this is Kanda. This is Vanda. Landa. Shenanda. Shenanda. If they were dwarves, they'd all have. Her and her 12 sisters. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the, everything has to be about what, don't push the creative process. It'll yeah. happen when you grow. Yeah. Because you want it to be about you. Yeah. And, uh, I've said it a million, so boring, but Bill Hicks said, less jokes and more me. Right. Right. And, right. And I, I find like when we finally get to the podcast level, which we're so lucky to live in the podcast era, um, it's true that it's, it is, it's more us and less, uh, less pushing, you know, you uh, could just, you could just be, and then yeah. you're not, na- every people are naturally very funny or interesting, yeah. you know, and, and if you just allow that, then that, you know, and granted, you know, some people do two and a half hour podcasts and you're like, you could, you could do a little line veto on that. Well, Feel free to edit a little bit, but, but podcasts, I'm as guilty of that as anyone else. But, but, and, and because the smartest man in the world is Greg Proops's podcast Thank and everyone you. should listen to it and Greg Yes. All right. There we go. So, but the, yeah, there's, it's so podcast listeners are so patient. Yeah, they are. It's, I think, as they're sitting at work going, anything, anything that isn't what's right in front of me would be fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I sometimes I do an hour one or like when I'm in Edinburgh, the, 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 the time allotted is an hour. Okay. So they come in at 56 minutes or whatever. And they're like, wrap it up. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you have to finish, right? Because there's another show coming on or whatever. The crew's right. done. And uh, people, you know, write me and go, hey, I got a two hour commute. You know, like the, their personal need. Right. They go, right. what happened? It was only an hour. It's like, isn't an hour enough, really? I mean, I oh. do do two hours a lot or more an hour and a half. But uh, I, I find brevity is, is probably something to be treasured. I'll, t- I'll tell you, uh, I just did one with Janine uh-huh. and Maria Bamford. And um, Garofalo wouldn't stop talking to start the podcast. Right. I had to hit record right. and go, we're starting now. And yeah. then at the end of it, I had to go, we're stopping now. And then I hit stop. And somebody said, well, why don't you just keep going? And I was like, because I'm tired. Yeah. I'm Madeline Kahn tired. Yeah, yeah. I can't fucking keep talking about beads <laughs> for more than an hour. <laughs> well, Janine has that ability, right? She's I she's always her. on a monologue that, that you know. She is available. She's oh, yeah. available to chat. It yeah, is yeah. awesome. Yeah. She's and, amazing. Yes. And it was, but it was so funny because I was like, no, we're done. It's good. Yeah, yeah. And, and she's get, still talking. 
She's still talking. Yeah. And she hung out for an hour and a half and with comics out in front, had a cigarette, yeah. and just talked for another hour and a half. Yeah. And, uh, and and now I'm sure Rangers of the Dork Forest are like, should have just kept it running. Just should have kept it running. Well, I mean, also the people that want to hear Janine, and it was true about her more than almost any comic I can think of 20 years ago. Uh, if I <clears throat> can date us a little bit, sure. Janine's a little younger than I am. Thank goodness. Who isn't? Uh, <laughs> w- was always a uh, and Paula Poundstone before her. From because I I grew as a young comedian in San Francisco. <laughs> Paula was the king of my Comedio? town. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. she she was she worked a crowd like nobody ever worked a crowd. Yeah. But her crowd really wanted to see her. They had emotional investment in her, and Janine's crowds always had that emotional connection to her. The that, same, yeah, yeah. They're uh, not maybe not needy is the wrong word, but uh, just connected. What, what's the symbiotic relationship? Right, of, right. right. They, they they're there and they sit and they you know. I yeah. did a chat show in um, uh, Bumber shoot several years ago, and I got Janine to do the show. And the place was packed an hour before, you know, right. because they right. knew Janine was going to be on. Yeah. And then, you know, she did her usual. She brought up politics and all kinds of things. Right. And it, when it turned into gags and Doug Benson came on with Ted Berry and all this oh, stuff. Good. But, but um, yeah, so I, I, you could have made a four and a half hour Janine show. And the people that love Janine will, would be would listening. Have, oh, yeah. The entire time. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, just yeah, going, yeah. This is, I listened to it for the third time and she said this one thing. Right. And you're like, yes. Yes, right. I bet she did. And <laughs> Right. They're pounding it in copper sheets. They're... Recording it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. Bamford's fans are like that too. Oh, Maria's I agree, fans. yeah. Yeah, they are on board with the Maria Bamford well, they're experience. Well, they're also emotionally available and always were. They're vulnerable, you know. Yeah. And there's something you want to take care of uh, them, uh, but you know that they are they don't need help. They don't need help, but you just so want to be there for them. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, it's neat. It's, 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 and, and. And they both give their fans a good, a good amount of time too. You know, uh, Janine is not online. She is, does not have Twitter. Facebook for or her. an email. Good for her. I appreciate that. So do I. I like the commitment. She said to me on the show, I don't have a website. And then I Googled JanineGarofalo.com. Turns out someone made a website yeah. and uh, it's got all of her dates on it. So uh, oh. there is a JanineGarofalo.com. Well, that's like you say, people are devoted. I mean, her fans are certainly devoted. And I'm that. sure her her people, management at some level, were like, yes, there will be a Janine Not Garofalo. being on Twitter is an interesting call. Mm-hmm. I wish I could get away with it, but I find that we have to because we're promoting our podcast all the time. And that's right. what I use Twitter for most of all. Right. And I like – and I uh, and it's not so – I've started following a bunch of people now, oh. which – I love following a million people Me too. because then it just keeps going and keeps going. The only thing I don't like about it is that it's another way for people to direct message me, like yeah. Facebook messaging. Yeah. And I'm like, just email me. Swear yeah. to God, attainable goal, Jackie at Jackie yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to check 19 different places to make sure I'm responding to everything. And, and then if people want to book me to do their crazy coffee shop, which I am also available to do, mm-hmm. uh, Twitter is not the way to do it. Uh, Jackie at Jackie no, is the way to no, do it. No, I'd much rather be emailed. Yeah, yeah, just because it's easier. And um, Well, you're going to check it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm probably going to have my book in front of me, which, yeah. by the way, is a piece of paper. Well, uh, see, that's bound. the thing. I have a book, too, with a piece of paper, and, yeah. uh, and that's where I keep everything. I don't put it in my phone. I don't. I lost my phone about two months ago, and I had a heart attack. And Right. You know, like, if, if I kept everything in the phone, I would just die. It would be even worse. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, that's crazy. So I took Latin. Okay. For five years, I so took. How's your Latin? Uh, it sucks. Oh. Uh, but uh, written in the beginning of my Latin book in high school was uh, that I was on loan, of course, because they just get. I don't, yeah, it was high school, so they you didn't have books. They gave you books. Uh, it said Latin is dead, dead as can be. First to kill the Romans, now it's killing me. Uh. Huh? It's a classic. <laughs> Did you take Latin? I did not, but uh, my mother told me she did, and that it helped her when she learned to speak pigeon Spanish. Basically, <laughs> well, good for her. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it is a helpful root language. I mean, I don't even know that it was their first language. Uh, I, I don't know where it came from. Probably, but I mean, not. it's so influential. Uh, people don't think that we're connected to the Romans at all, but of course we are metaphorically. But. Um, uh, I was going to say, is your Latin sine qua non? And it's not. Um, uh, we, 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 Latin words get used all the time. It, right. Uh, we, you're always hearing habeas corpus. Uh, mm-hmm. You're always hearing, um, well, for goodness sakes, the money says e pluribus unum on it. Right on it. Which is uh, why. Why? That's got to be some sort of... Uh, uh, it's a conspiracy, right. clearly. It's a mystical uh, we'll thing. We'll get Rick or Overton on. We'll talk because about it. Because why is it one out of many? Why is it one out of many? That's what e pluribus of, unum is. Right, right. And, and you're like... Why like is that on the money? And why is there a pyramid with an eyeball on it? Right. Um, but I mean, that's the influence the ancient world has to go even further and make it even more tedious. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
and and we have all Beautiful the dork forest cash. time in the world. All the dork forest time in the world. Well, I don't have a dollar bill on me, but nope. um, on your dollar bill, only twenties. That's yeah. the, that's how Greg proved it, right? Yeah, oh. I have hundred dollar bills and, and fresh roses. <laughs> oh, well, there there it was kind of there too, but um, the seal of the United States is that eagle. But there also sometimes you see it when the president stands in, at his podium. Yeah, um, the eagle's holding two clusters of arrows. That is so Roman. The Romans, absolutely, the imperial eagle is right. the symbol of ancient Rome. And every time you ever see a Roman movie, there's always people with standards. Yeah. And on those standards are giant eagles. The Nazis borrowed it. Yep. They use an eagle. Uh, the only country that doesn't use an eagle that I can think of is England. Uh, France uses an eagle. Russia has a weird double-headed eagle. Uh, oh, okay. Germans have an eagle. Mm-hmm. America uses an eagle. Right. And that's all from the empire. The, the influence of uh, that eagle holding what they that's- would have called uh, – um, uh, a fasces, which is a bundle of sticks together. Right. Our eagles holding arrows, right? right. <laughs> and there's always and Latin under everything. Under- but why? It's been a thousand, two thousand years, yeah. and we're still doing all these imperial things. Kaiser uh, and Czar are and, Z- and firm Caesar, yeah. right? Yeah. The weird. Here's what I've always wondered about Rome: is were there people sitting around Rome at the end days of Rome, talking about the end days of the Egyptian Empire? Going, I wonder. I wonder if they knew if it was the end. When the when the goths were I expect coming, they were. Yeah, I, I think they were because they were, uh, you know, studied and and because they lifted so much of their culture from all the cultures that preceded them. They're a yeah, weird they were, amalgam of different cultures, which and, is so much like the United States. Yeah, which is so. I mean, we're we're and the militarism. I mean, that's the right Pax, yeah. Pax Romana and Pax, uh, you know, Americana. Uh, it, 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 nice and rhyming. The, the the idea that there's this giant sphere of influence that you just hold. And they, the Romans set borders, right? They would go so far. Like, they never went all the way to Scandinavia. They stopped in Germany. And they never went all the way to Iran. They stopped yeah, just right. short. And they didn't go down into Africa because that's where they're afraid barbarians were. Now, they labeled everyone a barbarian that was a stranger. Right. And I think it's – I don't know where it comes from. I want to say it's Berber uh, – bastardization of Berbers because they did fight in Morocco. Right. Um, but it's probably some other derivation. Um, in any case – the barbarians weren't barbarians. The, a lot of the people they vanquished, a lot of the people they crushed, and a lot of people they fought were highly developed cultures with their own personal belief systems, um, money, uh, technology. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They were. I mean, they wiped, they whomped on the Gauls for what ten years till they finally subdued all of them, and it was hundreds and hundreds of tribes, and it wasn't just French people. There were Belgians and Germans and the whole right. fight. Um, but those people weren't backward. They liked to. Post like everybody didn't know anything till they got there. Right. Like these people didn't know how to bathe or cook till we showed them how and stuff, which is always how America approaches everywhere. You know, right. our imperialism was, uh. You yeah, were helping. We're yeah, helping. we're helping. Right. Yeah. We're going to make your country better, like Afghanistan and Iraq, which are both unbelievably volatile right now and there's no stability at all because of no. what we've done to them. Right. Uh, and I think that the people the Romans fought often felt, well, fuck you, you know, we yeah. had a culture. Uh, yeah. Greece, who they were able to take over, their culture had waned. They had, they were big, you know, 500 years before. So, right. so they were pale. They were susceptible, yeah, yeah. To, to, to the Romans coming in and just. And the Romans were like, well, everything. part of that is cute. So what we're going to yeah. do is we're going to co op some of that. It's we, like. We want your theater. Right. Uh, we want your learning. <laughs> uh, if you were, if you had any money at all uh, and you were a Roman, yeah. you, you had your children tutored by Greeks. Oh, really? And doctors were almost always Greek because they invented medicine, right? They invented right. Hippocrates and Aeschylus and all that jazz. And they had and, all that guy. Uh-huh. It's, you know, the United States, it's nice. What we tend to do is we open up a lot of. Vietnamese restaurants uh-huh. right after we, we get the food we get their food yeah, yeah, we're yeah. just like no no we're willing to bring a chili bring a chili yeah, over yeah. Let's I'm do waiting this. for the Iraqi restaurants to pop up everywhere you know where they are where in Michigan uh, oh of course right right because they have all those the, they, they get the Iraqis see they California get, we've been, it's Vietnam we got right. all the Vietnamese. we get Vietnamese we get you know what in Minneapolis they get Ethiopians oh and fantastic Somalis. right right yeah. from their epic from, 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 troubles right right from, from that horrible genocide yes. yeah yeah and then and then in Cal- and Alberta they're getting Sudanese. Oh yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and then uh, and and Iraqis apparently are flooding into. Uh, well, you saw the riots this week in Sweden last week. No, uh, they're, they're you know they the riots they're, in they're a homogeneous culture like they're white. You oh know, yeah, you know. start to finish. And uh, they yeah, in the last few years they've had a lot of people move in and they put them in projects and uh, they they fucking burned the town down for five days. A cop killed someone and it started that way like uh, it always does. Like it always does. A little too much uh, force. Yes, excessive force. But I think the the Romans, uh, uh, they're they're big. I don't know. They're failing. Their their achievement is yes. that one end of Europe to the other was connected. 
and that you could theoretically take roads almost the whole way, right? And Hadrian, who was a later um, – well, in the hundreds. Right. And most certainly gay, uh, traveled the, the length and breadth of the empire several times. He was the most traveled of all the – but Hadrian he, was he was he an emperor? Mm-hmm. Okay, because I wall. oh the Hadrian's Wall. That's it. Mm-hmm. It was and there was a giant fight about Hadrian's Wall, or was there the wall? Did he just build the damn wall? My Roman they built history, several walls, but the Hadrian's Wall is the furthest one, and it does not really in Scotland. It's in like the north of England. That's it. It's in the British Isle, and that's how far they went. I mean, and they didn't get into Scotland, and that was a no, big thing for the Scots. They left the Scots, yeah. Right. They left the Scots, Scots like- alone. <laughs> Instead, they built a sixteen foot wall that ran the length of the country. From one, from the uh, River Tyne in Newcastle on one end to the other end of the country. Now it's about four feet tall. Okay. And it didn't Has disappear. Has it been settling? Yeah, it did. <laughs> they, the people of the area have used it to build with for 2,000 years. That's oh, they've why they've just it, taken it, like, oh, yeah, there's a hole in my wall. I'm going to grab a right. brick off of here Everything and around it. the Hadrian's Wall is made of Hadrian's Wall, <laughs> 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 which is awesome. That is awesome. And they used to post um, colonial troops um, – there was always very few Romans in the legions once they got up and running. In the beginning, you had to be a Roman, and okay. then they extended it to Italian, and then they extended it to citizens. And so by the time they made everyone a citizen, we're talking about from Baghdad to uh, almost to Scotland, right? Oh, so right. a lot of territory from Germany yeah. down to Morocco. And almost Libya. anyone could become a, a citizen? If you were within their sphere, yeah. If, I mean, like, the reason why Paul in the Bible uh, yeah. doesn't get executed is he's a well, he's the publican, right? He's A publican is a tax official that is paid by the Roman government who privatized tax officials. That's how they get oh, collected taxes. Right. He's a Roman citizen. Okay. So he can't be executed. Okay. Uh, Peter, on the other hand, uh, yes. <laughs> didn't do as well. But uh, well, so there's, the you know, the Bible is... kind of, there's lots of Roman stuff in the Bible because yeah. it's the age of Tiberius when Jesus is purportedly happens. right, and, and Paul was the one who wrote all those letters, right? Yes, he Ephesians. wrote the letters to the Corinthians. And, and the Corinthians and, and the Ephesians. And the Ephesians. And the, that guy was chatty, and he was a bossy magoo. Well, That's I love, a, right, but I love letter writing, right? Like, they wrote letters. He, yes. So yeah. they had they had delivery system. Uh, yep. Caesar apparently had two scribes that rode behind him. Uh, At all times? Pretty much. He, he wrote several books. Um, there's one called the the war, the war against the French, the Gallic Wars, and then there's one he wrote about the revolution that he fought against Pompey, or when he tried to take over as, uh, you know, dictator or whatever. Oh, right. And then he he wrote another one as well, but he dispatched them, and they were pure spin. He had two guys, and they scribed all the time, and he dictated on the on the trot. Yes. And then those <laughs> were put back into you know in manuscripts or mm-hmm. tubes in those days. Everything there was no such thing as. Right, they roll, roll up the papers yeah, yeah, books and were rolled. boom, yeah. yeah. And they'd boom back to Rome. Then they'd post them in the town square and criers would read them out mm-hmm. and they were read in front of the Senate to say, I'm so awesome. Yesterday we vanquished the Giverni or yesterday <laughs> we did this and yesterday we did that. And he didn't, he minimized his losses and he amplified his wins. Sure. So some of the figures that he fought against, Vercingetorix, the most famous of them, uh, was a French king, kind of an elected king, um, we, only thing we know about them is what the Romans wrote because okay. there's no extant stuff about them. You know, you have to piece together their belongings. What's the name He's, of the French king? Vercingetorix is the one that has the helmet that has the feathers on it, like Asterisk and Obelisk oh, okay. from the cartoon book. Okay. They wore the helmets that, that have the backward feathers on them. And like was, Hermes? Yeah. Okay. He was supposed to be a, a big, good-looking uh, Frenchman, you know, and right. they they put this giant army together to fight the Romans. And the Romans have been there for years at this point, like seven, eight years. And they took a big hit at a battle, a heedless little battle. Caesar's biggest strength was he was a tremendous tactician, right? He took basically several legions and subdued a country with millions, tens and twenties of millions of people and killed right. probably a million. He did a some million. big genocide on, yeah. on the French. Pretty sweeping. Yeah. And um, But he, he did not have an army that was overwhelming. And they had a bigger army than him, but they were not organized the same way a legion was. Now, if you're a legionary... You learned to be in this, the army. You were provided with, you know, material, right. weapons, was training, tactics. Mm-hmm. They formed a, a testudo when they'd all well, put their shields up to, to go into when there was too many squares missiles stuff? flying at yep. them. Yeah. They formed squares. They knew how to flank. They, they weren't very cavalry oriented. They were very infantry oriented. Okay. And they fought in rows, ranks. So they stood behind one another and held the guy in front of them, right? And then oh, the, your, um, Centurion would blow a whistle, yeah. and that rank would fade back, okay. and the next rank stepped forward. So that's how they fought on the line, right? So when the barbarians come at you, right. you, you've you got your shield, right, yep. where you're holding it by the boss, yep. and you've got your uh, 
gladius, right? Yep. The short sword the Romans used. Okay. And so the first line fights for a minute or two and mm-hmm. hand to hand combat's extraordinarily wearying. In the movies, like in Lord of the Rings, oh. Even in The Hobbit, they yeah. hand-to-hand fight for ages and ages. They're with giant <laughs> swords, and they're fighting and fighting. I was like, if you did that for 10 minutes, right. you'd be exhausted beyond right. And you imagine 50 people over. coming at you and yeah. rocks hitting you in the head and, and flaming you know, Other... pitch and whatever. Okay, so they would. there was time. Yeah, they'd blow a whistle. Boom, here comes the next rank, and they go forward, and you fade into the back, and then the next rank comes forward. And in the back, people giving you water. There's water bears. There's people oh. with arrows. There's... Like in marathons, yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, they use lots Gatorade? of, yeah, yeah. They use lots of auxiliary troops uh, who were often colonials or people fighting against. Like there was French troops, obviously, that fought for the Romans. Okay, and, German, and they always had Germans, and the the emperors always had a German guard mm-hmm. that was their inner inner guard. They weren't even Romans; they were Germans, and so they only bore allegiance to the emperor. Right? Okay, so theoretically, they couldn't be bought. Right. So the Ger- the German guard was the inner sanctum of the palace guard. Okay, and. uh because they were giant. The Romans could never get over how big everybody was. Right. Like, right. No, up <laughs> like north. They were six feet tall with lots yeah. of hair. Yeah. So they're always depicted. And that's another obsession with Rome is uh, they're always clean shaven like their chests. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even though they're Italians. Right. They, they, they bathed a lot. The yep. bath was a very big part of a, of a day in Rome. Right. Even for poor people, poor people could afford to go to the bath. They kept it cheap. Mm-hmm. And you had sex in the bath. You ate in the bath. You did politics in the bath. You... You know, it wasn't just sitting in a tub of water. There was a tepidarium. Essentially like a coffee shop. Yeah. yeah. It was, okay. just, it was, if, if everything that happened in American society happened in a spa is okay. basically what Roman wow. society was like. And men and women separate. Right. Uh, and, uh, so they, they're always shaved. Right. They, 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 the, the amount of, uh, razors and tweezers and scissors that, go away in the Middle Ages when the Roman Empire falls and they <laughs> kind of come back in the Renaissance. Right. Like, people just didn't groom the way the Romans groomed. You You see how Caesar had the Caesar haircut, right? Yeah. And he's kind of bald. Yeah. Um, and and then later, Hadrian and some of the emperors start wearing beards a uh, right. hundred years in. But really, they kept it clean for Jean, right? And yeah. And you were covered in olive oil, no soap, and then you'd, you'd bathe, you'd go in the hot room, this cold room, back in the yeah. cold water, and a slave would... Wipe you off with a stick so that you were, and then anoint you with oil so you smell yeah. good and musk and whatnot. So wow. you, the, the, the gig was you went every day to the bath, you shaved completely. Completely. Oh, yeah. Totally. Like, like now. Yeah. They like, shaved their like, chest, they shaved their face, they, and they plucked their eyebrows, and they, and the women wore wigs made of human the, hair. And, the privates as well? The pr- I don't pubes? know what the, okay. I, I don't know that that was a big obsession with them. I mean, the naked body is a different thing. The, the Greeks were much more comfortable with it. Like, the Olympics were performed in the nude. Were, oh, were they? Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And the, but they, they had some equipment. Like, they, when they boxed, they wore, like, leather straps around their hands. Okay. And when they long jumped, they carried weights. Okay. So that they, they didn't just jump the way we jump, like, you see how they had to go mad dashing and hit the board and fling. Yeah. They used two weights to fling themselves forward with. Oh, two. to pull themselves. Yeah. yeah. So all those sports, the Olympic sports that are obviously all the dashes and distance running, mm-hmm. um, wrestling. Yep. Uh, uh, the put. Yep. Uh, then the exactly. hammer mm-hmm. and the javelin are all ancient, ancient, ancient games, right? Right. The javelin is it's the, just a so spear. old. Yeah, yeah. It's old. That's the first pointy stick fight in the world. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And the, <laughs> the Romans used a short, or they had long ones that every legionary carried, and that was what they shot first. Okay. Before they got to the line, everybody let go of their giant javelin. Okay. And then you fought up close and personal with a sword. Right. Hitting guys in the face, and you were always trying to cut open the lower part. Because then they bleed out. Yeah, or? yeah. So their guts would come out. Come out, and then they would yeah, die. Yeah, you that would way. stamp on their foot, put, stick them in the stomach, and then they're going to go down. And then yeah. they can't fight you anymore. And then you go to the next guy. Right, <laughs> right. But you weren't wow. trying to cut people's eyes out. You know, they weren't. It's not right. like the movies. They, you know, boom. I'm going to kick you in the balls, and then ugh, right in the giblets. My father would completely <laughs> approve of that. You know, one time I came, uh, I wake up 9 a.m. Uh, my father has been beaten up oh, no. uh, at the breakfast table, and I was like, "What happened? I'm nine. He goes, "I got, uh, I won the argument." Uh, I lost the fight. And, uh, uh, and and I was like, someone, oh, you got a fight? And he was like, yeah, yeah, but whatever, Pulaski or whatever. The, it was a, a Polish name. Yeah. And he goes, he punched me. I fell down. He started kicking me. And I read a lot of Louis L'Amour at this time. And I was like, he kicked you when you were down? Right. And Louis my dad Lamar's goes, heroes don't do that. No. My dad goes, yeah, that's what you do. You kick them when they're down yeah. so that they don't get back up. Yeah. Even when he's on the receiving end of the kicking, he knows this. Right. My he dad. approved of the fighting method. He methods. approved of the fighting method. He was like, then it was over. Don't worry about it. Right. Nice. Then we're done. I don't. I don't have oh. to get back up and fight. Oh. <laughs> I was like, "Good 
more death. No, don't get back up because you're just asking for it. Then, right. then you're asking for a beer bottle in the eye. Right. Well, and that, that my, my father's entire life is is how close can he get to you punching him in the face <laughs> to not punching him yeah, in the yeah, face? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My He's dad a like that bit too. of a button pusher. Yeah, anyway, yeah. So. Super aggressive. Yeah, very. But he would appreciate the uh, let's end the fight quickly. Yeah, the style of yeah, Roman, the style uh, of Roman uh, fighting. Yeah. Yes. So they would over they would overwhelm you with tactics like they're the the, the famous battle in France is um. Uh, uh, at, at, at Elysia, which is still there, and they've ex, they've excavated it and they've done X-rays from the sky and all that, so they've really tried to find what where all the positions were. It was a hilltop town, so the French had a big army and they all took all hid in the town. Okay, uh, and they thought we'll, we'll bring the Romans to us because they beat them a couple months earlier at a, a battle where Caesar lost his shit a little bit and sent the troops in too quickly, and they got wiped out. Uh-huh. So he lost a bunch of legionaries, and mm-hmm. which was a big. Slap in the face for your, you know, like right. like the Japanese, everything with Rome is pride and honor. Right. right? Everything's honor. So yeah. Everything's got to look often, right. Right. They often killed themselves, right? Suicide was a huge thing to Romans. Um, you were expected to fucking uh, if, if, say, if fall you, on your sword. Right. Right. That's them. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, them, yeah. right? Okay. And, uh, you know, all those things that Nixon's White House always talked about, falling on your sword in the Praetorian Guard and all that jazz. <laughs> um because when you're protecting in, Caesar, you know. Yeah, yeah. You uh, know what? Nixon should have fallen on his sword. You know. He was buried in his backyard like a dog. Is he I really? Could, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Hunter S. Thompson joke. Yeah, that's He said, great. I couldn't have been more pleased. They buried him in his backyard like he was a like dog. A dog. <laughs> well, he's, he's our most uh, broody. You know, that movie, uh, the one Ron Howard did a couple of years ago, such a, he, he really is like a exiled emperor, right? You know, Would the you, way they've got him, oh, the, right. the one the with Nixon? Frost and everything, because yeah. he's phoning him up in the middle of the night drunk and he's, he's, he was king and now he's, you know, reduced to this state and he's having to do a TV show to explain himself. Uh, and right. To try to rewrite what right. he can rewrite and. Yes, how can we. Which re- everybody wants the chance to do well, that. Who doesn't right? love a, my stepmother loved a revisionist history. Oh yeah. Right? It was, she was amazing in her own. She was Kissinger-like. She never went into Laos. It was perfect. It was, oh, right, right. Yeah, we yeah. never did any of those things. No. We never started war for oil or drugs. We would only start wars because we're honorable. Oh, yeah. We're going to help. Yeah, we're going to help. We're going to help. Well, that, that was the other thing is like the Romans had no concept of, um, uh, you know, personal glory was an enormous motivating factor. So if you thought, well, I want to go and invade whatever, Parthia, Armenia, Egypt, right. I'm going to do it. Okay. I don't care that they're our friends. I don't care that they exist on their own you know right. that they have their own agenda. Yeah, that they might not want us to stomp them. So it was all the individual with Rome. Well, I mean, it was part of a when they first started, they were a republic and they didn't have any kings, and that, yeah. they were really proud of that. And that lasted for you know seven hundred years yeah. or whatever. They would elect people to uh, lead them. They would uh, people were pressed into service that were farmers to fight, and then it got more and more organized, and they got more and more badass, and they started to take over more of Italy. Right. And then when they started to take over Italy. The big people they had to fight were Carthage, who was across the way in Africa, That's who right. were Phoenicians who'd moved to Africa, mm-hmm. who live at the top of uh, North Africa. And the Carthaginians were wildly advanced. And uh, I mean, they invented writing. Right. And, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, but their, was their knock on them was that they were practiced infanticide, which I don't know if it's wholly true, but you right. know, they did like to kill a baby now and then. And, you know, bad pub. You know, who knows Who knows where that came from, right? So they fought three giant wars against them over the course of a hundred years. Right. Three or four. And then finally wiped out Carthage and did a, a horrible thing in their last time they beat Carthage. They destroyed the entire city and they sowed the ground with salt so that nothing could ever be there again, right? Now, there's still a Carthage there, but it's a later version. It's a Roman version. Right. And it's their Vietnam, right? It's their... It's they transgress too far. Like in American history, there's two or three wars that are there's the holy wars. There's uh, World War Two, right, which is holy to us. Yes, there's the Civil War, which right. is holy to us. But the Mexican War, right. and Vietnam are wars where we encroached. Yep, no, we we did it all because we wanted to. Mm-hmm. It was and uh, we paid the the moral price. We bit off more than we could the, chew. The gods and, came down on us for yeah. those wars. Yeah, you know and. Uh, I think Carthage is the Roman one because they feel like they didn't need to vanquish them so utterly. They right. could have let them live and they didn't have to sow the ground with salt and make all those ancient gestures. That- well, do you think it's because they became too big? You know, like it's it's that thing where, where you can have a republic when it's, you know, 800,000 people or right. 100 million people. Like they say that, that, that the United States was freer in the 50s. Huh. Than it is today because there was, you know, there's th- what, 330 million people in the United yeah. States now? And there was 
Two hundred million, then one hundred fifty million. Yeah, so it was it was just easier to get off the grid. It was easier to just sure. be. And you didn't need an ID for anything. And there was no credit cards, right? So there was no record of what you were buying or selling or, or selling. And there was lots right. more independent businesses, right? And, they and just built the highway system, right? And you could li- and you had to live on what you had in front of you. Right. you there were places that were hard to get to, and people spoke different dialects way right. more than they do now. Yeah, like the country was really divided up into. Yeah. I, yeah. The first time I went to Mississippi, everyone in Mississippi was like, is it like what you thought it'd be? And I was like, you guys get cable. Yeah. I thought it would be the same. And it is. Yeah. It's exactly the There's same. There's a little more homogeneity. Right. I mean, they were complaining about this a hundred years ago, obviously. That once, once the wireless. When, yeah, yeah. Let everybody once know. Once there was radios that. and telephones, people were like, oh, that's the end of that. Yeah, Everyone's going to be the same now. Yeah. How are you going to keep them down on the farm? Well, and, when the printing press was got, you know, widely used in Europe, people were like, well, that's the end of culture. <laughs> Now everyone can read. <laughs> and anyone can write yeah, a book. Right. And now anyone can print a bloody thing and, yeah, you know, just all of a sudden Kindle. people are pamphleting. Oops. I mean, that's the one thing that <laughs> Romans don't have is their technologies, their engineering and their architecture are extraordinary. They're able to bring in water from faraway mountain peaks by using a various, you know, gradient that kept it flowing at all times using the natural force of the water. Right. Rome had zillions of aqueducts going into it. There was fresh water everywhere. On every street corner, there'd be like a little cistern. You see them when you go to Rome still. They have, uh, they're often big faces with a big mouth. Oh, you that's know? right. Yeah, yeah. Like a little bubbler. Yeah, like a little, like a yeah. little bubbler. Yeah. And so everywhere they went, they put that in and they still, ex- they still exist in Spain and France and Turkey. And you go anywhere where there was Roman world and the roads are still there. Yeah. The Appian Way is still there. Uh, which, because they knew how to grade a road, they knew how to lay down the gravel and then put, uh, yeah, it was several levels, right? Yeah, Yeah, they did. So the water drained to the sides. They graded roads. So you could march those legions anywhere. And that was the initial, but of course, it opened up trade and it made Europe more close because Rome in the day, uh, that was what's cosm- was cosmopolitan. There was people from all over the Roman world in Rome, including because right, you could get English from one people, side of the African Roman people. Empire to yeah, the other in like yeah. three months or something yeah. like that, or six months, or it was amazing. Yeah, right. And they had a port, and there was loads of commerce and boats. They weren't as curious as they might have been about sailing across the Atlantic to find the New World. Right. Uh, that was left to other cultures, but certainly they would have had enough money and wherewithal to send fleets to the new world. Right. Now they say it was the Chinese, right? With that giant fleet in the um, middle ages that that might've even got to America. Uh, also there's evidence that like Africans took boats to America oh, yeah? uh, and to the Caribbean. Yeah. Before Columbus, uh, certainly the Vikings right. did. Um, have you done, have you done some reading about the Chinese and the Africans and, and their ancient cultures? A little bit, but not, yeah. not nearly as much there's as Rome. Not, there's not as much written on it. And of course oh, no. they aren't as, it isn't as publicized. So. Well, they're not white people and we don't live in that. <laughs> if we were in more influenced so, by China than we were the Romans, then we would be talking about China. Right. I mean, the Chinese invented everything. They had paper money. When Marco Polo went to China, uh. When was that? Like. In the 1200s. Was it 1200s? He, yeah. Uh, uh, Kublai Khan was the emperor. Okay. And China had an empire that went basically from the steppes of Europe all the way to Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Like so their it went empire through the was entire almost Southeast all of Asia. Asia. Yeah. He, he supposedly, uh, Polo went to Vietnam. Polo went to, uh, Khan loved him and he spoke Chinese. Okay. And he spoke Mongol as well. And it wasn't an accident. His father and his uncle were Italian traders. They're from Venice. And so Venice was always seagoing. So Venice yeah. always dealt with the east. So if you could sail your boat to, uh, you know, the, the, the door of Asia, Turkey and, yeah. and up there, then you could take a land route all the way over the mountain. Right. And then there was the spice roads all that crisscross China. That crisscross. Yeah. Because the Europeans desperate for spices and silk. And that's what they wanted from, the, from Asia. And well, that's all they wanted. Right. <laughs> so his uncle and his father went there. And came back. And when they came back, they spoke Mongol and they spoke Chinese. Marco was a teenager. Mm -hmm. They took him with him on a trip. And he was gone for 20 years. And he met the great Khan. And uh, the great Khan loved him and took favor. He was a well-disposed young boy, as we say in the Middle Ages. Excellent. And uh, he spent 20 years. Khan gave him a job. He became like a tax collector. He saw these giant floating cities. He saw fireworks. He saw eyeglasses. He saw them use coal for fuel and coal to power things. He'd never seen that. Right. He saw paper money. He'd never seen anyone write a check before. <laughs> he was from Europe. Yeah. And they used bags of fucking gold and stuff. <laughs> uh, so the innovations the Chinese had, and, and they'd already perfected giant silk factories where silkworms were kept in tubs and there were hundreds of thousands of people. Working so Henry Ford 
Did not invent uh, mm, No. No, possibly. And, uh, the, you know, uh, he was blown out of the water. Also, the food, uh, the European food, you know, they always say he brought back noodles, right? And that's right. what vermicelli and is. And- but he was blown out by the subtlety and the, the depth and the, the majesty of the Chinese cuisine. They had uh, everything had to balance with something else. There was sweet, there was sour, there was piquant, there was, you know, they, there's, I don't know that much about it, but there's, you know, whole charts and books and. Yeah, the, it's a philosophy. Also, you know, they had acupuncture. They had a giant philosophical system. They had right there. They, it was all preventative medicine. It yeah. wasn't, and and they so, didn't do a lot of surgery. So he was part of the Mongol Empire, and the Mongols were who were running the show then. But the Mongols had the Chinese under their subjection mm-hmm. in the, in this era. So he finally made his way back, and before he left, the Khan gave him a giant imperial seal, like a letter, basically of transit. Please allow. Marco Polo, to don't fuck with him in any way, and you must give him, you know, put right. him up for the night. Right, right. So he traveled back with a giant caravan, then took a boat, came all the way back through, uh, uh, oh, crossed th- through the, the waters. Yeah, yeah. He didn't cross the. the um, did he Africa, go under he, the South Cape or? No, he didn't go around the Cape. Okay. N- supposedly, no one did that till the Portuguese, but of course, I think ancient someone explorers. Must have. Yeah, yeah. Clearly, <laughs> yeah. Africans and you know, yeah, Africans. the Venetians got everywhere, and the Venetians might have done it. Right. And they're from Lebanon, so. He came back through a boat and then took the land route and got back to Venice. And he appeared in Venice and everyone was like, where have you been, right? Right. You left 20 years ago. Now he's 40-something. Right. And he told the story. And his nickname in Venice was Il Milione, the million lies. Because none of it could have been real. Uh-uh. Talking about floating cities on the water and firework shows and women with bound feet and and uh, uh, and paper money and and coal. And the way and the Mongols fought, they would they would take uh, the people of the town, whoever they could capture, and march them in front of them, mm-hmm. so that if you were sieging a city, all your cousins and family are in front of the fucking conquering army, so you have to kill them first. If you right, mm-hmm. right. And Mongols could um, fire off. Somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six shots, maybe maybe ten even. And I think about every few seconds they could right. fire off an arrow at a full tilt gallop. So Holy. from like wild Indians, right, upside down, backwards, hanging off the horse, right, right. And they had superior bows to Europeans. They used an amalgam bow that they used bone and they used glue and made a a, a bow that that, that was stronger. Really, and, yeah, yeah, yeah lots of tensile reach? strength. Okay. Yeah, so you could shoot through armor. So the Mongol army was a million people on horseback and a gajillion wagons full of arrows following behind them. And they foraged as they went. Yeah. And so and they, they lived off the land. Yeah. They were able to conquer a good deal. And Genghis, Kublai's grandfather, had started, or Genghis, I guess they call him. Right. And they say Genghis is one out of five people in the world related to him. That's how much he got around town. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's an, a very uh, – so he got uh, Marco – Oh, the Venetians were always at war with the Genoese, which yeah. is where Columbus is from, right? That's right. And the Genoese are on the water too. And the Genoese were slavers. And in the Middle Ages, they fought each other constantly. So because he was a rich person, Marco, um, uh, put, a, put a galley together. I mean, it wasn't like there was an organized army. The Venetians were kind of a little loose. They had the doge and all that. Right. Shit. So in any, in any case, during a naval battle, he was captured. So he was thrown in jail. Uh, and it wasn't a jail like like we do jails where we have these psycho, you know, solitary confinement and uh, yeah. and make people have mental breakdowns and everybody rapes each other. It was, they were all kind of in a big room and because he was kind of a noble, right? Uh, he wasn't in the worst part. Right. And he met a cat it, while he was in jail named Raffaello of Pisa. And Raffaello said, what's your bag? And he told him the story. This yeah. is what I did for 20 years in China. Yeah. And Raffaello went, this is a book. Really? Yes. And Raffaello wrote, and him wrote the book. And because uh, it was then, Raphael Logan, uh, it has to be in French because only sophisticated people are going to read it. Yeah. And it has to be in so French. So that's why we have the adventures of Marco Polo. Now, some of it's, you know, uh, extrapolated. Sure. And Raphael threw in lies. Sure. Because He's like, he, well, we got to sell. Right. He would jazz it up, right? Like Marco <laughs> would go, no, you, you don't understand. I saw a wall of people do this. I saw 10,000 people marching in a thing. I saw uh, uh, the most delicate f- food and the bouquets and the alcohol yeah. and the women and the. And and Raphael going, yeah, there's a place where people have feet in their heads and, uh, you know, people right. have dog heads and, you know, like, <laughs> let's throw that in too, you know. Right, they're magical, right? Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're leprechauns. So it's quite a good book, a Mar- Marco's book, but uh, you have to take some of it with a grain of salt. But, I mean, the truth is he did, like I say, 
paper money, coal, silk, all those things the Chinese had. A banking system. They had an international banking system. I swear to God I've taken a class that discussed Marco Polo's book, but no one has ever assigned Marco Polo's book to me. Yeah. Have, have you read Marco Polo's book? I, I've read parts of it. There's a, a, a Is it a bit of a chore? A, a condensed part. Well, the, the writing style is real medieval, so it's like, uh, dear reader, now let me tell you about this place. <laughs> In this land, you will find that the, the, the meat and the milk, meaning the drink and the food, like everything's right. meat. Oh, you right. Know, meat just means like what you would eat. Right. It doesn't necessarily mean meat. Uh, and and the the women are most comely and um, uh, in this place they they find that they must uh, stay on an island and once a year the men come and visit you know it's not the, it's the not paciest. very linear <laughs> yeah, yeah it's a bit fairy taley okay uh, there's a book by Lawrence Berger on about the adventures uh, where he kind of tries to get to the facts of the story and that one is more I think coherent to read okay yeah yeah um, it's uh, Stephen Mitchell wrote a book uh, called The Gospel According to Jesus, which really helped me. Really helped right, me. Right, to the, break down yeah. what he's talking about. Well, yeah, Jesus is so nice. contradictory. <laughs> uh, uh, there, at one point he says he's not for marriage and man and woman, and then at another point he... Part. And what, uh, what Stephen Mitchell did is he, he essentially bled off all of the extraneous stuff, and he was like, all we're going to do is we're going to write down... And it was about 30 pages. Mm. And he said, it's just, it's what Jesus might have actually done and what Jesus might have actually said. And right. then he's got ancient Aramaic and he's got, and the rest of the book is explaining why he picked those 30 th pages right. worth of nonsense. And, and he bases it loosely on Jefferson's, um, uh, gospel according to the, the Jefferson's Bible. Uh -huh. Um, which I cannot remember the name of, but Me it was, neither. he, well, the weird thing about Jefferson's Bible is that they printed up and gave it to every member of Congress. Really? Yeah. Separation of church and state, 1908. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, uh, but every member of the House and the Senate received a copy of Jefferson's mm. Bible, uh, in, I think it was 1908, but whatever. And the woman who was sworn in, uh, or there was a Muslim sworn in, uh, this year, but, uh, the first Muslim that was in the Congress was a couple of years ago. He swore in, cause you don't have to swear in the Bible. Right. And it, there is one, like, atheist who won't say she's an atheist and she didn't swear in on anything. Okay. Uh, but for the one Islamic member of Congress, used uh, now there's two used um, Jefferson's Quran. Oh, really? Yeah, Jefferson had a copy of it. Oh, that's awesome. That's what they swore in on. Oh, good. Yeah, isn't that fantastic? That is. I yeah, would yeah. love to see Jeff Jefferson's Quran. Right, and yeah. did he annotate it? You know, when he's such right. a pedant, did he sit there? Is there scribbles all over it? <laughs> right, right. Are there right. like little pieces of paper stuffed in it? Where oh, I take exception with this part. <laughs> right, right. Because the Quran <laughs> is clearly the. It was supposedly spoken through Muhammad oh, and then absolutely. repeated, right? So in the, in Bibles where all the things said by God are in red, the mm. Quran would be all in red. Yes. Right? So did Jefferson line veto the Quran? <laughs> what Quite <I> possibly. <laughs> <laughs> if he didn't, he ought to. Uh, yes, and of course we have nothing against Muslims. Jefferson's so weird. Jefferson? Yeah. It's, I love that you, that you, that you tried to read the Marco Polo book though. I want to try to read the Marco Polo the, book. The, um, one of the, he sounds fascinating. One of the shallow, yeah, stores on, um, Melrose, uh, had these little, uh, <laughs> uh, like, it condensed history books, like they'd taken parts of, um, books and sort of give you the hot spots. And the part of the book, of the Polo book was like India. Uh, so it was the last part of the journey. Okay. Was like the, and so it's all about this. You know, he says there's an island where there's no man. And, you know, like he oh, kind of makes up some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, right. And then there's one called the, uh, the Romance of Alexander that was a condensed version that I gave to a very good friend of mine who passed. But uh, the, Alexander was written up well after he, he brought um, – he brought a historian with him. Okay. Who was Aristotle's nephew. He brought um, oh, right. a historian on the, because they were Greek or Hellenic, they were from Macedonia, but they were, yeah. Aristotle was his tutor. Right. So he, <clears throat> his father was the king of Macedon and hegemon of the Corinthian League or whatever. Mm -hmm. And anyway, <laughs> he hired Aristotle because Aristotle was famous. Right. To come up and teach the kids. Mm -hmm. So with a bunch of teenage boys and Alexander being the chief prince, got their education from Aristotle. Right. So they knew about, Geography, science, it wasn't called science then. Right. Um, philosophy. And Aristotle's the one who gave him the burning curiosity, right? Yeah. On top of the fact that he was a monomaniacal. <laughs> oh, Alexander? Alexander. And that his father was a superb commander and had put this giant army together yeah. that could really kick some ass in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. So he had his father assassinated, most likely. His father was remarrying. His Alexander's mother was named Olympias, and she was a, a, a witch, right? A Hecate. Okay. And she was in the Dionysian cult uh, where they would go into the forest and supposedly rip men to shreds and whatnot. She said Philip was his dad. Right. 
that uh, it wasn't uh, Philip uh, that gave uh, her Alexander, that Zeus appeared as a snake and copulated with her. So he was a descendant of Zeus, ah, yes. which he kind of believed. And that's the weird part about ancient history, too, is that like, we're to think that this person who from the age of teenager till he died at 32 and conquered from the eastern part of Europe all the way to India right. and back. Right. So his empire is extensive. Yes. Uh, it doesn't last. It falls apart when he Almost dies. Almost immediately, and breaks right? up into a bunch of different empires. Yeah. So Cleopatra's a Greek name. Yeah. The, the woman, uh, he, the dad, Philip Dumps, uh, Olympia, um, marries a young Greek girl named Cleopatra. And at the wedding is assassinated. And Alexander makes sure that he runs down and kills the assassins immediately. So no one ever knew. <laughs> so then he takes the army, subdues all of Greece, puts the army together, fucks off to Asia. Right. And then conquers the world. Um, but in the meantime, he sent everywhere they went. He looked for curiosities. He looked for oddities. He found things and sent them back to Greece right. to Aristotle. Oh, okay. So he brought Aristotle's nephew with him, who he eventually had killed because everything went wrong on the road. But um, sometimes you they get also bored. measured yeah. everywhere they went because they're Greek. They fucking counted the Steps. miles, yes, yeah, of how far they went. Holy so he shit. brought a historian with him to spin everything he did into how great it was, right? To write the book, to write the book. Uh, well, that book's not existent. Ta part of Ptolemy's books are, uh, I mean, and, part, and he had a general um, whose name I'm blanking on, Narcissus or whatever. Uh, he had a, an admiral. Right. And that he wrote a book, too, about Alexander. And then all these subsequent historians wrote the history of Alexander. But that got bastardized into the Middle Ages as the romance of Alexander. So in that one, he not only does he conquer the world and stuff, he flies in a machine and he right. meets the Amazons and all kinds of, you know, like he, he's a superhero, sure, basically. Sure. It's a comic book. Yeah. Um, but supposedly the Amazons, he did meet them and he had sex with the Amazon leader who came for the very express purpose of Sure. Of sleeping with Alexander. He was also supposed to be remarkably short, even for then. Like straight up Judy like Garland. 11. Yeah. Judy Garland short. And wow. so when they finally conquered the palace uh, in Iraq, uh, or is it Persepolis? I can't remember which one it was uh, in Iran. They, they, he walks in. He's king of Asia. They've beaten Darius and all that right. in a series of giant battles. And he comes in to sit on the throne, and his feet are too fucking short. And the regents uh, who were, who worked for the previous king see how fucking short he is in panic and <laughs> run and get a table and stick it under his feet so that he won't look like a kid with his feet right. swinging on the throne of Asia. Oh my God. Um, but he, he fought giant, giant battles, but Alexander fought. Caesar was a fan of Alexander and Augustus was a fan of Alexander and Alexander's chim, his body was taken when he died and put in this weird glass sarcophagus, which apparently existed for hundreds of years after his death. Ptolemy, Mm -hmm. uh, was the king of Egypt, uh, right. uh, was a general and, and a Greek from Alexander's army and a buddy of Alexander. He got Egypt. So he started the Ptolemies, who oh. 300 years later is Cleopatra. Okay. Our Cleopatra, the one we all the know. The one we all know and love. Because that's a Greek name. It means right. father loving. Oh. Cleopatra. Cleopatra. And uh, so oh, right. the, his tomb was in Alexandria. And uh, Caesar went and saw it. And, and, uh, Augustus went and saw it, who was Caesar's nephew after him and apparently knocked the nose off of Alexander. And then it disappeared. So that's always a big thing. They're always looking for Alexander's Body. sarcophagus and tomb and all yeah. that shit. It doesn't exist, but no, hardly anything of Alexander's physically exists. The coins and that he started Alexandria, which is the most famous thing he did and the most important thing he did because Alexandria took over as the leading learning center of the world after Athens. Right. So for a thousand years. And what year are we in now? Uh, 323 is when Alexander BC started okay. his trip. So about four years after that, he founded Alexandria. Okay. And he wasn't there to watch it turn into the, cause he croaked. Right. He only lived another six years. Right. But within the he, next hundred years, it's this meeting of Egyptian and Greek knowledge and right at the, the top of the Mediterranean. Right. right. So it's it, because he didn't think Cairo is a medieval city Yeah. and the Egypt, the Egyptians, the, the lower or the upper Nile, right. Which is the lower part. That was where all their holy cities were, Memphis and, uh, oh, right. and all that jazz. Um, at the very end of the Nile, where Europe is over the other way, and yep. the Middle East that way, that's where he put his city so that the Greeks could get there. And right. it was mad travel. So the Cleopatra spoke Greek. She also spoke a lot of languages. But for hundreds of years, the pharaohs of Egypt didn't even speak Egyptian. They spoke Greek. 
And so that's why the Rosetta Stone, when Napoleon found it, yeah. it, it's so important to deciphering the glyphs from ancient Egypt because the stone is written in Greek, which yep. people could read. Like yeah. we could still read it. You know, there are scholars ancient who Greek. can read ancient Greek. And it's in glyph. Yep. And then, or hieroglyphics. And it's in Demotic, which was the common tongue of Egypt. So by going through, that's how they deciphered. Champollion and a series of French linguists, right. ph- philologists, uh, yeah. went through and deciphered the ancient script using that stone. And that's why the Rosetta Stone is so famous as you now you see it in the airport everywhere. Right. Cause now it's how you like, decipher a language. It's, I think the Mormons created it. <laughs> <laughs> they're really good at it. Should I be funnier when I'm talking about any of this? this no, <laughs> <laughs> there's no need. I am a comedian. I do. Stre- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I've made myself hysterical. But the fun part of Alexander is one, one, he committed genocide on Asia, but the, the, the good, it he, is hilarious. He had a boyfriend. And he had several wives. He married Roxanne, right? The famous uh, Af- Afghanistan princess, right? Who was supposed to be the most beautiful woman in Asia. Okay. He had a later wife. Um, and he had another baby with. And then they assassinated her and the baby. And the baby. So, so that they could split oh, up the Oh, so empire. that Roxanne could, yeah. Yeah. They, so she would, there would be no question, you know. Because apparently on his deathbed, the, all the men were gathered around him. And they said, who will lead if you pass uh, Xander? And he said, the strongest. Uh oh! <laughs> Yikes! Because <laughs> yeah, that's how he played. But yeah. he had a boyfriend named Hephaestion, mm-hmm. and Hephaestion and him went to school together. And he was his right hand man. He wasn't the leading general in his army. He was just right. always there right. for him. And he gave him a you know he was an officer. Sure, he had a, he had a unit that he d- commanded. And apparently, when they got to uh, Turkey, first of all, Alexander threw a spear from the boat so that it would land in Turkey, right? So that. I'm taking back Asia. Right. Because they've been, the Greeks and the uh, Persians have been fighting for a zillion years. Right. Like in the movie 300 and all that, which precedes this. Right. So they went to Troy. Mm hmm. And because Alexander's favorite book was um, The Aeneid. The Iliad, yeah. Okay. And he carried a copy of it under his, kept under his pillow. He liked it, The Iliad? That was, Achilles that was, was his, his main man. Oh, and really? Achilles is, as you know, the unfeeling, heedless, brave one, Pain right? Pain in the ass, Right. Man. Hector is the, actually a more admirable person. Yes. But, yes. but Achilles is, uh, you know, bad to the bone. After Patroclus, his best friend dies, he spends yeah. three days crying mm-hmm. and then saddles up and fucking fights, what, a seven hour battle with back, Hector. takes it back, man. Yeah. Takes it back. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to take some and names. And drags Hector's body around the city for three, three days. Three times. Yeah. yeah. Horrible. Yeah. Horrible. So, uh. They went and they danced naked around the tomb and supposedly <laughs> took Achilles' shield and sword. Uh, you know, even then course. there was fakery. Right. But he had, the, uh, and, and through his entire 10 year campaign, Achilles' shield was his shield. Okay. Which had the Medusa on it, a Gorgon. Okay. Right. So yeah. that you could turn your, on Everybody his breastplate, just... he, he had a Gorgon. Right. And he wore a giant white plume so he could be recognized. And uh-huh. Alexander led from the front, unlike any other general, the front. Uh, before the battle started. How did he ma- die? And he why died of, uh, they think, maybe a malaria, a uh, or- alcoholism, <laughs> uh, his mad wounds. He had Could have been dozens anything. and dozens of wounds. He took an arrow to the chest in India that went all the way through his breastplate into his lungs. And they didn't think he was going to live. And he lived. You know, in the military, when you're, when you're, when you're on the ground in a battle, uh, if you're an officer, you take your insignia off. Yeah. So that they don't just shoot you. No, no. He was the first one up the wall. The, the battle in India at Malia. He is... might have had a Napoleon complex. Oh, well, Napoleon had an, <laughs> had an Alexander complex and read Alexander constantly and analyzed oh, all of his battles. And so did Caesar. They analyzed all his battles because of his – He uh, even now, I think, if you talk to a, a general in the American army, they might say Alexander's the best general of all time. Not because he was lenient or anything like that or nice. His tactics are extraordinary. They were always outnumbered. Like strategy wise. They were always outnumbered. When they fought Darius' army, one time, I think Darius had maybe 100,000 people, and they had like 30,000. And somehow they beat him. Because he would divide and conquer. He'd send one guy this way. They'd, they used phalanx. They didn't fight like the Romans. The Romans okay. had legions. Are uh, phalanx with, the lines, yeah, the four uh, lines that come? Right. The, okay. Phalanx is a, is a diamond, and everybody's got a giant long spear. Okay. So they march with them up. Okay. And then when they get to you, they come down. So it's bristling like a, a porcupine. Yeah. yeah. And that's how the, the Greeks fought, right? Okay. In phalanx. So, but he led the cavalry unit because he was hot dog. Right. And uh, he had a group of boys with him that were his inner group. They were mm-hmm. called the hetero, the companions. And they were so, called the hetero? Heta- yeah, the hetero. Hetero. <laughs> and they had, they had a cry that they would go, ay, 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 ay. They, they had a battle cry and all this. So he led the cavalry unit while he had all of his other generals. 
running the infantry. Okay. So when they would beat him, often they would... He was heedless as fuck. Sometimes yeah. he'd go right into the line, and other times cut off the line and try to divide the flanks, right? Right. Because when the ancient army, the right flank's always the one that's coming at you, so if you could cut off the left flank, you could come behind them. And once and you could come behind them, people broke and ran. Yeah. And that's the idea, is to get the army to disperse. Yeah. So you could chase them down and kill them. One because you don't want to fight them on the line. Yeah. Uh, and Alexander did that time and time again. He also destroyed the city of Tyre. Um, he laid siege to, I think we talked about that last time. Oh, that, time. that last time we mentioned that, yeah. But I mean, like, so he's, he's amazing that way. Yeah, he, he drank a lot and they didn't dilute their wine. Romans, uh, put honey in their wine and pine resin. Oh, like flavored and, it and stuff? Yeah, yeah, okay. nuts and stuff, cheese sometimes, <laughs> uh, and water. Wine and cheese. You, you cut it. Yeah. Okay. But Macedonians drank wine straight as it comes and they really put it on. Oh, like, wow. They really drank. Right, and, right. Um, he burned a town to the ground when they were drunk. When, you know, there's, mm-hmm. He killed his friend Cletus when they were drunk. Um, Cletus said some shit. You know, they were having a drinks party. Yeah. Symposium, as we call it in Greece. <laughs> and, uh, you know, where you lay on couches and slaves. Sure, sure. Fuck, uh, they peel those, grapes those and things happen. Dishes of wine, you know. Yeah, yeah. Craters. And uh, Cletus said, uh, you know, about you and shit. And Alexander went, what the fuck? And Cletus <laughs> said, at Granicus, a Persian was about to cut your fucking head off. And I cut their arm off, which is a true story. Right. Alexander ran up the hill with his horses, crossed this riverbank. They were the first ones over. The army went shit. Came through the river, hand to hand fighting on horses. A Persian was about to fucking do Alexander, and Cletus cut the guy's arm off at the shoulder. Right. Oh, wow. Saved him. So at that party, he goes, "I fucking saved you. So don't even fucking start with me. <laughs> You're the son of Zeus and shit." <laughs> and Alexander, they. Separated them, you know, they came back, they separated one of those drunk fights. Right. And Alexander took a spear off the wall and fucking threw it through Cletus and killed him. And killed him because he had saved his life and dared to say, I he, saved your life. At one point after Tyre, they were in Egypt, and the Egyptians were glad to see them because they had been under Persian domination for about 200 years and they weren't that keen on the Persians. Mm-hmm, and they mm-hmm. figured, well, the Greeks will be better than the Persians, you know? Yeah. So he didn't really fight his way through Egypt. But after he's there for a few weeks, there's a, 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 a an oracle out in the desert called Amon, uh, or, or Siwa. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a dangerous trip, and he took a little, small group. And this is why Alexander is so legendary, obviously. Everybody tells the same. Right. So he takes a small group across the desert, and if you get lost, you're dead, because you've got to find Siwa in right. five days, or right. and because that's where the water is. That's there's right. an oasis there. Right. Siwa's still there, and there's still an oracle. And there's a big oasis full of date palms, and, you know, it's the one little garden spot. Right. So they get really lost, and, the, the, you know, the fucking dirt's in their eyes, and the sand's everywhere, and there's snakes and whatnot. And a crow appears and flies, and Alexander's, not crows for us, that's for me. Yeah. Zeus. Sent the sent, crow. Mm-hmm. So they find Siwa. He goes into the uh, oracle. The boys are standing outside. And then he goes into this inner sanctum. This is for me. And me alone. I'm going to ask the question, which is, am I the son of God? Oh, Jesus. So he goes in, and his bad, uh, uh, the, the priests who were there didn't speak Greek that well. And I think they misunderstood what he said. And the way they would do it was, there was a, a, a hidey hole in the wall, and a guy would hide behind it. And so when you would ask the question of the oracle, oh, okay. yeah, they could finally answer <laughs> through. And so they said to him, uh, he said, am I the son of Zeus? And they went, yeah, yeah, you are. And I don't know if they quite understood. And, and in Egypt, Zeus is Amon. So he was, he was Zeus Amon, right? Mm-hmm. So when he's depicted, he's always horned with two ram's horns, because that's what Amon was like. So when you okay. see the coins from Alexander of Asia, one, he's a European interloper. Yep. And two, he's a goat god with right. a big fucking horn. Uh, so when he came out of the thing, they were like, what did he say? And he's like, they told me what I needed to know. Mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. not only am I destined to conquer the world, I am the son of fucking Zeus. And <laughs> th- therefore, I am almost a god. Myself, yes. So all the wounds he took and all the things he did, he was, I don't know if you'd call it brave or just completely heedless. It, felt, it feels like a death wish at some point. Very much so. Just like, and know, he dealt death too. I mean, you know, he, yeah. he was as... He was put himself out there because he wasn't afraid of it, but yeah. he also killed lots and lots. You know what I mean? Lots like, and you know, lots of people. And in the in for fun in between battles, hunting, hunting of, of animals, yeah. animals, a lot of to kill them, to kill them. Because yeah. so he was really that person. He's a and at the same time read philosophy, sure, read the well, Greek tragedies and wept over them. You know, like he was a cultured person, right? Right, right. He brought he, scientists with him on the trip. 
they they collected information everywhere they went. Right. He didn't make people switch to becoming Greek. He didn't make people That's change amazing. their religions. He he would take people and go, well, you're if you defied him, he would annihilate the place. If right. they sent out emissaries and a couple of chicks and all the gold, right? Yeah, it's fine. Look, I'm in charge, but you're still in charge. Yeah, yeah. That's how he did it. <laughs> and they did that in India. They did it all over. The Afghanis fought them the hardest, which is why I can't believe we ever invaded Afghanistan. That if ancient yeah. history teaches you nothing, it's impossible to win in Afghanistan. Yes. And then the British. And the British. And, and then the then, Russians. And then the Russians. And then, and then, but we repeat, repeat. Mm-hmm. And the Afghans idiots. just sit there going, seriously, mm-hmm. you're here again. All we want to do is grow some potatoes and yeah, uh, yeah. and have our lives. Yeah. Really? Nothing? Yeah. Okay. Do whatever you want to do. Oh, there's another good one since you bring it up. Uh, the, the biggest moment in history, in my opinion, isn't ancient Rome or Alexander. It's the moment when when Europe uh, connects to the Americas, right? Obviously. Okay. Not, not necessarily the moment of Columbus, but right. within that period. Because within a few years, Europe has... Tomatoes, potatoes, and corn. Right. And then coffee, tobacco, everything else, right? Right. And the vectors start to spread, and then all the silver from Mexico goes to China, and, you know, the whole world becomes this giant, what we know it's now. It's ball, yeah. But there was famine like mad uh, all through Europe. They would, people would just die in tens of thousands. But potatoes are like the perfect food because you can literally almost exist on potatoes and nothing else. Yeah. They have vitamin C in them, they have vitamin right. D in them. Right. And you can bake them, you can fry them, you can you yeah, know they're Yeah, they're pretty zany and Did you and read that Indians Michael Pollan fucking... book? The the potato uh, pot apple book? Oh no. Michael Pollan. Is it good? Yeah, yeah, it's essentially the history of like the three foods that changed the world. Oh yeah. And one well, of them is pot, is, one of yeah. them is the apple and one of them right. is the potato. Yeah, so I mean it's so I mean, there's not... so many great Imagine the world without potatoes, because there was a world. Pre, Half the world didn't have potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> they were, it was a and pre-potato world. Indians invented corn. It they, was a wild thing growing. Wait, like the Native American Indians yeah, invented they, maize? They, they cultivated it. They performed horticulture on it. They bred it. They, like Gregor Mendel or whatever botanist you can think of, mm-hmm. and there was a zillion varieties of corn because of that. Now we live in an age where... All corn is that one kind of crappy corn and Monsanto and all these people, you know, right. we live in a genetically modified world now. Right. And there's a million kind of potatoes too with different uses and different colors and different the, textures. And, the and pot- now they all want to boil it down to those right, right, those white weird, ones, the russets or whatever. Those russets from Idaho and uh, – They travel. I, they yeah, travel I, and they keep. I, I like uh, – yeah. But the purple ones have more nutrition in them. You should, you know, I, I grew potatoes once. Potatoes could not be easier to grow. Yeah. I got to show you my, where, where, they grow where. from each other, which is the awesome part. You don't need a seed. So do onions and, and garlic. Yeah. I put onions and garlic out there. And, uh, cause you know, I live in Van Nuys yeah. and, um, if, if there's anything you could afford in Van Nuys, it's land. And, mm. uh, <laughs> so, um, we have a garden cause you know, we're at war and, yeah. and I have my victory garden going, but, uh, matter of fact, just pulled some, some awesome cucumbers off the, off the vine. Wow. But, um. Uh, yeah, you can leave with some veg if you like. Uh, but the, uh, the, yeah, so what, okay, let's, we're at an hour. Let's, uh, but I did want to ask you this is have you traveled, uh, Roman Empire? Have you done much of that? Uh, here and there, yeah. I've been to Aspendus and Turkey. Uh, you've been to Turkey? Yeah. You know, I'm, I was never allowed. I wasn't, when, when I was this close to go, my parents were like, please don't go to Turkey. And so I didn't go to Turkey, but we're, I want to see Troy. Did yeah. you get to see Troy? No. No, no. We go? were only in uh, we were in Istanbul and then southern Turkey uh, uh, near a town called Antalya. Was it gorgeous? Yeah, yeah. stunning. Which uh, it reminded me of the Bay Area, pine trees, and the weather was the same. Really? It wasn't that warm. It was like yeah, well, we were there in April, and um, the weather in Istanbul was like San Francisco, and the weather in Antalya was too, like a little bit foggy in the morning, yeah. and then like kind of cool. Burns off, and yeah, and then uh, we saw uh, the, the the harbor at Antalya is a Roman harbor, so it's still the same shape mm-hmm. because the Romans dug it out and built that fucking breakwater and made it into a, <laughs> right. you know, a perfect horseshoe. Yeah. And when you sit and eat above it, you look at the Roman harbor. And then Aspendos was a Greek place. It was also a Roman place. There's a giant Colosseum there that they left. Okay. That we went to. Uh, I went to the top and I said to my wife, say something. You know, we spoke to each other. Oh, right. Because they- 100 yards away. Yeah. Because the acoustics are fabulous. Right. And, um, and then I've been to, uh, uh, in Paris- and London, there's a little bit of Roman stuff left. I've been to Hadrian's Wall. Okay. And then there's a legionary camp uh, outside Newcastle that I've been to. I've been um, to Bath. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I've been to Bath. Oh, and Bath is deeply Roman. That's why yeah. it's Bath. I mean, that's they why it's love Bath. the waters, right? But Anytime the only... they could build a fucking Bath, they built a Bath. But that's the only thing. I've only been to London and Bath. Yeah. So, whatever. But London has, there's like a Roman wall kind of near the city. There's not, and dig this. So, my wife and I were there in March, and um, we we're walking down near the Thames behind where the um, Savoy Theater is, like the embankment. Okay. And... We walk up this one street, and I swear to God, I see a sign that says Roman Bath. And near a closed tube station, there's lots of closed tube stations that don't work anymore, and they just okay. close them. Huh. And the tube is, you know, how they even got it built in London. London is basically a bunch of rivers that are waiting to right. fill the tube with water. <laughs> right. It's uh, a wetland, isn't like it? The reason, yeah, the reason why all the streets in London go like this is they're following riverbeds. Right. And uh, They're so just there's windy these, as all hell. And London is, I think, probably 30, 50 feet above London. You know what I mean? Like, there's so much... Mini layers of London, like Tenochtitlan or whatever. Didn't they build some sort of giant fence out in the breakwater to stop the tide? Yeah, they tried. And then they, and they were also going to use tidal energy, but they, they find that everything falls apart when you stick it in the ocean because of the fury. But right. Yeah, I think they tried to. Uh, I thought they well, did They just found it. a Roman uh, boat. Uh, who was digging? Bloomberg's company, I think, was digging up a, p- a part of the old city of London. Okay. And they found an entire Roman thing, and now they have to dig it all out. And right. Pick and up all they the can't, yeah, right, yeah, you can't yeah. do... No, because everything belongs to the country. Yep. If you find a cache of Roman coins and people find them in the countryside, because right. the Romans were there for hundreds of years, um, you They're can't keep yours? those Roman coins. No, you're no. supposed to give them to the National Trust. you got to give them to the Queen? Yep. Yeah. You know what would be country. nice? It would be nice if they gave back the Elgin marbles, huh? huh? Yeah, there's a few things. There's a, you, really? i got to give you these coins? Why don't you give one of those statues mm-hmm. back to Greece? Which Greece petitions for every year. Every year, it turns out. And I'm sure Greece is like, yes, thank you for saving them. That was lovely. Yeah, that was uh, great that you just took them. That was, but the, And they could have gotten destroyed, right? They could have. But uh, we Ish. could like them. But we could, we could take them back at any time. Well, it turns out we English, have buildings now. There's more Egy- Egyptian stuff in, in yeah. the British Museum. The Rosetta Stone's there. It's not in Cairo. I know. It seems brutal. It well, seems... in the Pergamon in Berlin, the entire Ishtar Gate is there from... Uh, wow. Yeah. Holy I mean, shit. They took it piecemeal <laughs> and moved it. So you walk through it, and it's all that blue tile with all the dragons and right. griffins and everything. It's stunning. Yeah. But you think, why isn't this there? But then, of course, after what's happened in Iraq for the last 10 years, everything's probably... Smashed Destroyed. within an inch of its right, and then, Turkey makes a rum seem like two weeks ago because the Turkish history goes back so bloody far that you're yeah, yeah, they're Johnny come lately, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a, and I'm sure the Indians would like us to leave as well. Anyway, um, their, their fervent wish. Well, their fervent wish. You ever see the Indian newspaper when you play casinos? And, uh, it, you know, it's a national yeah. Indian newspaper. Yeah. And obviously casinos are a giant part of their game now and everything. And on the cover of every issue, it has America in 1491. Yep. America now. There's two maps. And then 1491 maps, all red. All red. Yeah. Good times. Yeah. And so, you know, the last time I was up in uh, northern Michigan, it was the summer. I was in the Upper Peninsula. And you could totally see why they're still mad, because it's gorgeous. And there's nobody up there. And you're like, you could leave at any time. It'll be Also, fun. they get a bad rap. I mean, the Indians, first of all, there was lots of them. There was lots more. And sure, this, millions, this, right? The, the germs that the Europeans brought really wiped them out more than anything else. And not on purpose. Mm. But, no, I mean, these are all accidents of history and stuff. The, the Europeans loved to blame the Americans for, bring, for giving Europe syphilis, mm. but it probably existed before then in some strain. Who knows? But uh, they, uh, they had high culture. Our constitution is based on the Iroquois constitution. Right, right. The you know seven, what I mean? Like, yeah. You know, the, they really gave us everything. And the white people that taught the pilgrims to live that that the winter that taught the, yeah. had been kidnapped and spoke English and they'd been to England. And yeah. That's why they, that's why Squanto and Samoset spoke English. It wasn't just some bloody coincidence. They never teach you that in the history books. Right. They just walk in and two Indians fucking speak English <laughs> in Massachusetts. They'd been to England. Right. Right. It turns out the tra- travel goes both ways. folks, mm-hmm. And it always did. And that's the big lie. I think of history. I, I think the world was more connected than we ever like to imagine it is. Yeah. Greg Proops. <laughs> this is, I, I, I'm willing to leave it on that, right? I'm willing to go. It's, uh, this has been great, man. It's, uh, I, once a year, people are on board with a Greg Proops episode of the Dork Forest, as am I. And, uh, and if you get a chance, please go see Greg Proops doing stand up comedy, because I love it so. Thank and, you. Um, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me on, Jackie. You're welcome. Take care of each other out there. Bye. Thanks a lot for listening to the show, everybody. You know the credits. Patrick Brady's going to fix this audio. And Mike Rickberg and Sarah Cohen 
sang that song in the beginning. Mike composed it. He's going to sing again in about a heartbeat, the Mexican hat dance. And Vilmos fixes the websites. Feel free to donate if you haven't donated. I'm hoping everybody gives me a hundred bucks a year. That's right. And if you don't have a hundred dollars, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. It's just tell everybody you love the show and feel free if you like to buy merch. Maybe you want a Ranger of the Dork Forest t-shirt designed by Salmon Bemel Benrood, my nephew, or you want a Brett Chambers designed Dork Forest t-shirt that is in green or brown, which is exciting. All American made, so they run big because they're made by Americans. Because while I'm willing to wear clothing made by toddlers, I'm unwilling to sell clothing made by toddlers. In other news, uh, JackieCation.com has all of the information, including links to DorkForest.com and iTunes and all that stuff. Feel free to review the show. Feel free to buy stuff on Amazon. And thanks a lot for listening, you guys. Take care out there. Bye. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. (laughs) My hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh my god. Thank we you. why don't we just call that as the end of the show?